Biblical Perspectives on the News is produced by the Interreligious Council of Lynn County, which is solely responsible for its content. The views and opinions expressed on this program do not necessarily reflect those of the staff and management of KCRG TV9. Good day. Welcome to Ethical Perspectives on the News. My name is Leon Tabak. I will moderate today's discussion on the topic of challenges to science. Now the starting point for us here is some recent discussion, recent publication, of reports that some large fraction of uh, research results that have been reported can't be reproduced. And we might also want to think about uh, the difficulty of communicating complex scientific ideas to the public, to the people who make public policy, and so on. To help us explore these issues, we have three guests, which I'll introduce now. Uh, Brandy Shinada is a colleague of mine at Cornell College. Brandy teaches st statistics for us now. She's also done some work in uh, statistical consulting. She has her own, uh, she's self-employed in that capacity and has worked for a variety of clients helping them use statistics to solve problems. Um, Helen Harton is a professor of psychology at the University of Northern Iowa, and I'm going to learn a little bit more about her in just a moment. And Carrie Thigdor is a professor of philosophy at the University of Iowa, who also has a background in journalism. So let me ask each of you to, to sort of flesh out that picture for our audience a little bit. Tell us a little bit about your, your own background and interests and, and sort of what brings you here to us to talk about this topic today, maybe. So Brandy, tell us a little bit about your background in statistics, maybe about this consulting work that you do, sure. and about maybe, maybe one or two ideas about the, your principal objectives in teaching uh, undergraduates at the subject. Oh, sure. Um, so I do statistical consulting in a wide range of fields, um, which gives me uh, a great deal of enjoyment to engage with statistics in a broad background. Um, and my primary, what I consider my primary job is translating those statistics into something that's accessible um, to my clients and to the general public. Okay. And so when I go into the classroom, one of the big focuses that we have in our classroom is how to take those numbers, which often sound, um, we use, you know, standard deviation and students start talking about p-values and hypothesis tests and power and take that to something where our students can then um, talk about it in a way that's meaningful outside okay. of the classroom. Okay. So that's, that's the end goal. Okay, Helen, you are you're teaching psychology at the University of Northern Iowa. I think you have some other interesting parts to your background yeah. too? Um, yeah, I'm a professor of psychology and I teach research methods and social psychology. I'm also associate director of the Center for Academic Ethics I'm at UNI and um, I'm an open science ambassador as well, which is kind of relevant to the discussion here today. So a lot of the things that um, we're going to be talking about today I find very exciting because you kind of started framing the question in terms of you know a problem. But I right. think that the exciting thing that's come out of this is that there are a lot of solutions that we're able to address now that we perhaps weren't as easily addressable in the past. Um, and science is really um, responding to these, and especially certain sciences. So social psychology, which is my field, has been one of the areas at the forefront of some of these changes. Um, and so I've been involved in hearing about those, and you know, I get, I get the latest thing that people are coming up with on my Twitter feed and things like that. Um, as well as economics and um, cell biology and some other areas. But um, it's an area that I've been interested in both because of my research interest in ethics, but also because it affects all research. And so um, as I think the scientist on the board, um, I find these things really interesting and exciting. So I think statistics is an important part of the training of a, a yes. person in psychology. And then uh, some of these questions about the replicability of, of these uh, experiments has, has come first of all in psychology, but it's also been seen in other uh, scientific mm -hmm. disciplines. So Carrie, mm -hmm. you are, you are uh, you're the last uh, one. And, well, yeah. <laughs> the so, last for best. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, well, so um, I have a background as a journalist as well. Right. So I was a journalist before I became a philosopher. And, uh, and that kind of uh, 
so I work, one of the areas, I do philosophy of science, which is philosophical issues um, arising from various sciences, not just psychology or neuroscience, but across the science, uh, you know, lots of issues about what theories are, the relation between theory and evidence. Um, but a new kind of area in this is the whole problem of science communication. And this has been, be, has become an important area and much more, uh, you know, vividly in the public eye because of problems regarding the communication of climate science and the public acceptance of climate, sci climate science and then, of course, public policy regarding climate science. Um, so my interest comes from the, the idea that, you know, you've got on the one hand, uh, you know, interest in science, how scientists go about their jobs and produce knowledge and how does that knowledge get communicated to the public for the use uh, for public policy. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to ask for a volunteer here. As I say, the, the, the reading that prompted me to uh, propose this topic to our producers was this phrase replicability crisis. Mm. And I wonder if, if one of you might address where this came from, what that phrase means, you know, with, you're saying it's yes. not a problem. But, uh, <laughs> well, no, I mean, I'm not saying it's not a problem, but I think the, the term replication crisis has been used a lot in, in science recently. And it came because of several key articles um, that came out suggesting, you know, again, largely from bi biology, economics, psychology, other fields, saying that um, studies had been, people had tried to reproduce studies to do the same study, um, and the results didn't come out the same. Mm -hmm. And so one of the articles in psychology, for example, that came out a couple years ago in science, found that depending on how you talk about it, 35% or so of the articles were the only ones that replicated. So the majority yeah. didn't. Part of the problem with this, though, is that it's hard to know what a replication really should be. So how do we define whether a study replicates? Is it that you get exactly the same result? Is it that you get the same result within some area of confidence? Is it that you get generally the same result? And then secondly, do we even, you know, if you fail to replicate something, that could mean that the first study was wrong or the second study was wrong. But it could be that both studies are right and that there's some other difference in between them that is really what led to the failure to replicate. So, um, for example, I, one of my areas of research I've done is in helping behavior. And so I was in Florida in graduate school before this, and we would do studies, and there's a well-known finding that if there are more people present, people are gonna be less likely to help someone. And this has been you know, replicated across areas and, and in different situations. When I came to Iowa, I did a helping study. Everybody helped. It didn't matter whether they were by themselves or whether they were in a group, whether, you know. Welcome to Iowa. Happened. Yes, and so, you know, I don't think that that means that all the other research is wrong. I think right. it means there's something different about Iowans and maybe Iowan culture that led to that difference. Is this a topic your students uh, hear about? Uh, oh, we yeah. absolutely, we talk about um, replication um, and we talk about it and the words that I think is really important to focus on here is, is each study adds a different nuance to our understanding, right? This isn't about whether a study is right or wrong or black or white. This is what is the totality of these studies? Um, and how can we put them together to have a greater picture and a, and a better understanding of whatever that topic might be? Um, and so I'd like to get away from this, this thinking that there's a right or wrong answer, there's a true or false, and get more uh, closer to a spectrum, and we, and we want to know where on the spectrum um, the information is leading us. So Carrie, oh. here I am, I've mm -hmm. done some research, I'm hoping to get a grant for the next piece of research, mm -hmm. or I'm, I'm, I'm doing research in a field that I think is very important for our, our nation, our community, the world, and I, 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 want, I want backing for my next step. And I've got to communicate this to people who are going to make the public policy. They're not trained in science. If I admit that my results have some measure of uncertainty, mm. I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm shooting myself in the foot, aren't I? Is there, is there an incentive here to 
exaggerate our confidence? Is that part of the problem? Um, well, there's, I mean, part of that communication issue, I mean, there's a, there's a couple things that I wanted because I, okay. I, uh, I, I yes. kind of got, oh no, yes, there is truth. There is such a thing <laughs> as truth. Please don't, please don't take that away from us. Um, but to, to, to get to your, your question, I mean, the translation of research results, you know, reproduced or not, I mean, so there's a number of different issues, but, you know, assuming that you've, you have a perfectly fine research study with a fairly clear result, mm -hmm. you know, within, if it's a statistical, then it's going to be within some, mar there's some margin of error, but, you know, presumably it, it reaches a particular threshold of confidence for asserting the result. Mm -hmm. There's always this pipeline of translation you know, through the media, which is where most Americans get their science news, unless they are seekers of science news, which is definitely the minority. Mm -hmm. um, and the journalists themselves are under a lot of different pressures to put out the story that's the most, you know, striking. Right, so they're going to emphasize studies that have a really interesting sort of new result or one that, you know, resonates in some way it, with a news peg, right? Nothing They'll look for that. A sound bite. Right, the, the sound bite. And, and so what happens is you get a, what scientists will complain about is that there's a great deal of simplification that goes on mm -hmm. from, what they, from all the nuances that r get reported in the study mm -hmm. to what the journalists are actually reporting and um, there's there are lots of cartoons about this but one is you know a, a scientists find out that you know this particular drug has a you know 60 percent you know uh, it, it helps people you know 60 percent of the time or something like that it improves their condition and and the newspaper report is like cancer cured right so this is dramatic sort of simplification and dramatization that puts the onus of the problem on you know journalists. Right, the scientists blame the journalists for oversimplifying, but you know the journalists are often they're under a huge amount of time pressure from all sorts of you know sources in their editorial offices. They are often not even science trained because right. so many science journalists have been fired, have lost their jobs over the past decade because of the defunding of news. So it can be a general assignment, re assignment reporter who is, you know, sort of, okay, you know, cover this. Uh, why? Because we saw it on that, t you know, that TV program, so you've got to go do this. So they're very much under, you know, time pressure, but also they don't necessarily, for no fault of their own, don't necessarily have the expertise right. to be able to, you know, assess the way they could if it's a non-science story. Right, and I should say, I mean, I work for a university, but one of the biggest problems in terms of oversimplification and hyping is actually university PR departments mm -hmm. who okay. will, no, I'm, this is a, a study I just saw recently was right. you saying that it's actually not even the reporters or the scientists, it's the universities mm -hmm. that are, you know, taking their, their scientists, right, at their, um, putting out press releases that really hype the research in a way that, you know, how responsible is this? Well, you know, and then the reporters are taking the press releases and they don't have a lot of time to do more than make a couple calls, right? right? So it's, there's a lot of different, you know, there's, a, there's plenty of blame and responsibility to spread around here. And I think, I think one of the things, you know, that, uh, that I would like to see more of is more recognition of the fact that, you know, it's not the journalists, you know, that are, you know, over, only oversimplifying. And it's not the scientists who are doing various, you know, n you know things with their data, right, or, or not, you know, producing results that are as clean as they ought to be or something. Um, it's, and it's not the universities that are to blame for needing to promote themselves. Mm -hmm. It's like everybody has a piece of the epistemic pie. So I'm, I'm going to ask Helen and, and, uh, and Brandy to exercise some courage here. All right. Uh, so there's a phrase that comes up in this debate, p-hacking. So this is a very technical term. 
And I wonder if we can help our audience understand what this is about. Mm. So, do you want to go? Um, so, so p hacking. Um, first, we need to. What the heck are we packing? Right. Um, and that's what we're hacking. There is a p value, right. and something that's often lacking is this fundamental understanding of, of what that is. Right. And at its core, a p value is a probability. Right. Um, and it's a probability of making a mistake because there's uncertainty in statistics. And so we can use, we can manipulate um, our data in such a way to change that p value, to make it smaller and smaller to achieve something called statistical significance. Um, in a nutshell, that's how I would describe p hacking. But it's, it's redefining our terms until we get the results we want. So there's a famous pollster named uh, Nate, Nate Silverman, mm -hmm. who, uh, Silver, yeah. Silver, who, who published on the web a, uh, a site that invites readers to predict whether the, uh, the, the, the electoral success of one political party or the other will improve the economy. But the website has a bunch of buttons. You can define economic uh, progress in, in any of a half a dozen ways, and you can define the success of the political party in any of a half a dozen ways. And by testing many hypotheses, you can get to whichever conclusion you want. If you start out and you want to prove that the election of Democrats will improve the national economy, you can find a, a, a correlation among variables with a high degree of confidence that makes that case. If you want to do the opposite, give the other party the, uh, the advantage, you can do that too. And that, that was presented as a way of trying to illustrate this possibility of hunting for a hypothesis mm -hmm. that will uh, give us the confidence we want. Yeah, and I think that it's not so much, I mean, there's some extent to which it's, you know, people want the results to come out in a certain way. But there's also an extent to which this um, is kind of institutionally encouraged. So in order as a scientist to get better known, you need to get publications. To get publications and to get publications in good journals, you need to get results that are statistically significant. Um, and so it would become common then for people to look at the data in different ways in order to get that sort of magic number so they could reach that threshold. And I think that a lot of times people weren't doing it in some nefarious way, but it's also, you know, there's a lot of, I, I kind of like the term researcher degrees of freedom. When you're analyzing data or when you're deciding to study, there are a lot of decisions. You can define economic um, success in different ways. You can measure your variables in different ways. You could decide to control for, you know, well, maybe gender has an effect. So let's take out the effects of gender and look at it without this. So there are a lot of choices that you make. And so what scientists would typically do is, you know, you make these choices as you're analyzing the data. And so scientists fall prey to the same biases that we study. So, you know, we have this hindsight bias. We're like, oh, yeah, that's the way that I plan to do it, even if it might not have been the way we plan to do it. Once you get in there and you start looking at things, you can justify a number of different decisions. And so that leads to um, the, these choices that people make, which could lead to them, you know, analyzing the data in different ways. One of the new solutions that people have been working towards on this is pre-registration. So before you do your research, you lay out and you publish um, what you're going to do exactly so that you stay to that plan, um, not just because people might you know, nefariously do it, but because people might accidentally um, do it and not, and not really think about those things until they're in the moment. So do I understand that correctly to mean that I then have an obligation to announce all of the hypotheses I've tested and not just select the one, the one that gives me the result that uh, that's going to get a publication because it has the high significance and so on. And not yeah. just the hypotheses mm -hmm. you've tested, but the assumptions that you've made mm -hmm. along the way, right? We should be as clear and transparent as we can about assumptions we've made, about data collection methods we've used, mm -hmm. about how we've defined the population we're interested in. Um, if we don't do those things carefully in the beginning, and if we're not transparent about how we did them, um, then we open ourselves up to easily being misinterpreted um, and intentionally being misinterpreted. And one of the other sides of this, so the, the two parts, you know, you, you mentioned the replication crisis. Some people are also now saying we're in the renaissance. So there was this crisis for a long time. We were in the dark ages, but we didn't really know we were in the dark ages. And now we're finally coming out and realizing and addressing some of these things. 
In addition to transparency, openness is the other big push now. Um, where people are publishing along with their article, you publish your data so that other people can analyze it and make sure they find the same thing. You publish your exact measures so everyone can see exactly how you measured this and, and you know, how you defined your different variables. So the public might have seen this problem uh, you know, without, without all this technical terminology. They see it when they, they read a report about the, the uh, effects on health of drinking coffee and then, then the next week they read a report that gives the opposite conclusion and a month later it's healthy today, it's unhealthy tomorrow, it's healthy again the day after. And that might, might, might breed some skepticism about the authority of science. So I've read some people who say some of, these, some of this kind of research, we should just, we should, we should publish it at all. We shouldn't confuse people by telling them it's healthy today, it's unhealthy tomorrow, it's healthy again the next day. Is there anything to that, My No? Well, I, th I mean, I think there is in the sense that uh, people in general are, are not comfortable with uncertainty. I right. mean, just as a psychological factor, we, we don't like it, you know. Uh, so, uh, so there's that, that discomfort. We want, a, we want a clear answer, right. right? We want it to be, you know, yes, it cures cancer or no, it does not. We don't like anything to be sort of, well, it's got a particular probability of helping or something like that, which is exactly what these sciences are doing. Is mm -hmm. they, you work in probabilities. There's, there's no way around that fact. And, uh, and so the, the uncertain, so when, you, and then there's this other factor of, well, what's gonna capture the public's interest? Right. Well, it's you know if it's if it's coffee, everybody drinks coffee. They're going to be really interested in it. So that's why you're going to look right. at that story as opposed to something that might be really you know boring from the public's perspective, but might be really interesting from a you know from a psychological or a neuroscientific or something perspective. And and I would argue, rather than suppressing data, rather than suppressing interesting results, maybe it's a better idea to educate the public to become more statistically literate. Now, of course, I emphasize the statistics because, well, that's the field I love. Um, but not they don't need to understand uh, the formulas and, and really delve into this, but to be statistically literate and to understand that when they read a study, we're talking in probabilities. We're talking in likelihoods. We're not talking in absolutes. Um, or we're rarely talking in absolutes. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't give an absolute about that, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I think perhaps part of our job should be at educating the public, whether that's at um, an elementary level or high school level or college level, but introducing this concept of statistical literacy. And yeah. you go ahead one of the things that I think that we can do now, you, you talked about some of the issues in communication, so how journalists aren't necessarily um, trained in, in these areas. One of the things that the internet has opened up that I think people are starting to do is scientists can now have a discourse with the public directly. Right. Um, and so that's a way that we can explain our findings in a way that's, that's clear to people and that doesn't have to go through you know, press offices that want to make it sound bigger than it is and, and everything else. Why don't you elaborate that phrase, open science, that you used during your, your introduction? Um, so the, the Center for Open Science is a group um, run by Brian Nozick, started by Brian Nozick, mm -hmm. um, that has really promoted a lot of these ideas of transparency and openness in science. And so, um, you know, he's worked with people from a number of different fields in science. And the idea is, is again, that we want to be transparent in what we plan to do. So setting up ahead of time, pre-registering what we plan to do. Um, making our, our data available to others, making our materials available to others. So the idea is that we don't want to keep like this little secret where we run studies and then we come out with this result and then we just pop out with that. But you know, let people see everything that goes into it so that we can have a better scientific product so that scientists can really evaluate our data, our actual methods, rather than what we just report on. Um, and often in journal articles, specifically, uh, especially in the past, you know, you're limited in how many pages you can have. Right. But now with the internet, we can have supplemental information, we can have a lot more information available so that scientists can do a better job of evaluating each other's research and sort of accumulating them. So for a long time, we've used this 5% uh, oh. rule, right? And so that has a, 
that goes back what 80 years or something right or I mean it was Fisher and, right so yeah. some people are suggesting instead of 5% it should be 0.5% uh, we should have a higher confidence and this will uh, this will solve the problem others say that's nonsense uh, you have any comments on oh, that? Oh, I do. Yeah. Um, so this concept of having a cutoff value where um, if we get a p-value below 0.05%, we suddenly achieve statistical significance um, is, quite frankly, a little ridiculous. Um, is, is something with a p-value of 0.051 not significant? Right. right. Um, so having a hard and fast cutoff has... Uh, not made sense, and in fact, um, the American Statistical Association, the ASA, um, has a great, very short um, statement on what a p-value is, mm -hmm. how to interpret it. I'd really encourage anybody interested in finding out about that to go to the ASA website and um, uh, read that. But one of the things that they really encourage is rather than looking at a cutoff, we just look at the p-value itself. That, that gives us all the information we need. The smaller it is, the smaller that number is, mm -hmm. um, the stronger our results, in a simplified way of thinking about this. Um, and that number, that's what's relevant in a lot of ways. Are we? Yeah. I and, and, and there's so many other things, and, right? Yeah, because I, I was going to say, I, I would say it's effect size is what you should look at, not, <laughs> not p-values uh -huh. at all. Well, and uh, psychology so and, and statistics kind of differs in that a little bit. Um, but effect because size you, is very important. Yeah, and, I mean, you know, and one of the things to remember, too, is that, you know, part of what this crisis has brought to light are other practices that have been going on that have been accepted that we needed to rethink that again are, are easier to address now, like small sample sizes. When you run something with a small sample, you might get something that comes out and looks like a big effect just by chance, just because right. you happen to have a certain conglomeration of people. Um, but now, again, with the internet, it's easier to crowdsource, it's easier to get participants, and so people can get larger samples to get more reliable effects um, and to get more consistent. Yeah. We're close. To, we're close to the end of our discussion, so I, I want you to think a little bit. If there's, if there's some message you want to leave our audience with, either to, uh, to tell them more about the importance of this problem or ways that they can educate themselves more, uh, is there something we want to want them to take? Well, I, I, I guess I would just say that it's it's more than just the the statistical issues that we've been focusing on. Right. It's it's also uh, biases on the part of uh, journal editors in terms of what they're willing to accept. That's mm -hmm. changing as well, you know, so that's part of it. Um, mm -hmm. uh, it's also education, um, not just journalists, but also the public. But, you know, in particular, you know, journalists have been resistant in, in many ways to learning, you know, statistics and mathematics. I think that's changing a little bit, but it's certainly not part of your standard journalist degree right. to work with numbers right and and that that's something that uh, that I've advocated and other people have advocated to change we and, and just I think a few ed seconds. educating yeah. scientists as well yeah. so um, getting these ideas out there they've they've been several fields have been very prominent in it but I think spreading these ideas and making people more aware of the issues is important Brandy a few last words I uh, statistical literate <laughs> Statistical literacy and critical thinking. Okay. I think those are the keys. Take Brandy's class. <laughs> Take and my class. We we'll talk about morning. fun things. Okay. And philosophy. <laughs> well, thank you all very much for a great conversation today. I think thank we you. found uh, uh, an important topic and an interesting topic for our audience. Thank you for joining us on Ethical Perspectives in the News, and uh, see you next time. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.